Okay, we have some people joining us now, so we'll get started. Welcome everybody to part one of Forest Invases, where we'll get to hear about a few different pests threatening forests in Canada. I'll actually be subbing in as moderator for this Forest Invasive session, so you'll see a little bit more of me today. Just a few housekeeping notes, there will be time for questions after each presentation, so if you have questions at any time, please add them to the Q&A box and I'll read them out loud for our speakers at the end of their talk. With that, let's hop right in with our first speaker. I'm excited to introduce Quentin Giard from Natural Resources Canada to talk about Cyrex noctilio. You can share your screen and get started whenever you're ready. Uh, here we go. And Quentin, if you just want to put it yeah. in yeah. the other, Is perfect, it, it looks great. All right. All right. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Quintin Guignard, and uh, I just arrived in Sault Ste. Marie to start a new uh, position as a research scientist. <clears throat> and um, I specialized in visual and chemical ecology of insects. So basically, what they can see and uh, what they can smell, I guess. Um, the, the aim goal is to mostly work on uh, pest insect and to lure them into traps. So if you think about it, it's uh, a lot like today. I guess some of you are gonna be lucky to uh, have a great night outside uh, for Valentine's Day. And uh, basically you are going to try to uh, catch the heart of your partner uh, using the exact same trick I'm trying to understand in insect to catch them. So basically you want to look good, have a nice outfit to be as attractive as possible, which usually uh, involves some colors. So insect use that too, but it doesn't mean that you, it's not because you like, for example, a red outfit on your partner that you want your full house to be red. It would be a little bit aggressive. So there is some study to understand there uh, why is that so same way you want to use a little bit of perfume for tonight because it's made nice uh, but we all know that too much per perfume is quite deterrent so understanding all this uh, trade-off the setup is also important you can be well dressed and smell good but if you take your partner to mcdonald's tonight i'm not sure she he or she will even get into the restaurant uh, so we have to think about all of the things when we put trap for insect pest uh, in a forest or in crops. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about the vision of insect because it's a topic that not a lot of people have heard about. And I thought I'd start to uh, talk about it a little bit more because very, very little is known. So here you see a graph of basically uh, visual acuity in, in animals. So us as human, we sit on the top there. Uh, we are basically the, the best at that. We can see very far, we can see very small detail, and we are only outcompeted by some bird of prey, not all of them, but all of the rest of the animal are below us. So to give you a comparison point, um, see that scale is in logarithmic uh, scale here, and it's in what is called cycle per degree. So it's kind of related to that vision test we have uh, at the doctor where uh, a normal human usually see just above that red line at 30 cycle per degree. When you are when you have a good eye, you see as little as uh, 60 cycle per degree. So that's where we are here in that scale. If you can't even see that first letter, which sit at three cycle per degree, so somewhere here, you are what we call legally blind. And that's more or less how you see the world. So then you need corrective uh, glasses uh, to try to make it a bit uh, better. So most of the animal don't see as well as us. Here's another example. Here's a picture of a flower at one meter, 20 centimeter, one meter of a flower if you are a human. And that's the same if you are a butterfly or a bee. Here again with that spider, so I couldn't find the human equivalent. So you will have to think that you are a pigeon for that talk. Uh, sorry for that. Um, but just to compare with dragonflies that have the best eyes in the insect kingdom, you can only barely see anything. So you see that visual acuity is uh, 
not that great. And in addition, don't take those picture, uh, take them with a little dose of salt because here you can see the color like we perceive them. But I want to go to a, a space where insects don't see the same color as us. And that's what I want to try to show you today. So at here at the bottom, you have a human eye and that's a insect eye, but they work exactly the same. The light gets in, they hit the photoreceptor cell at the back of our eye or through the somatidia in the insect. And we have specialized cell called photoreceptor that have the exact same protein that absorb light. So basically it's, that protein is called an opsin. And in the middle of that opsin, you have that uh, chromophore here, that molecule that is bended. And when it absorbs the light of the right uh, wavelength, so light is a photon that move up and down at a different frequency. If it's very fast, it has a lot of energy and it's in the spectrum of the ultraviolet UV, for example, if it's slower, it goes towards the red. And when this chromophore absorb wavelengths of uh, right color, it changed from a bended position to a straight position and because it's surrounded by that top scene, it's leading to a depolarization. So if you take the, that molecule by itself, it absorbs light that we can't see. The fact that we can see different color, it's because uh, humans are mostly trichromatic, means they have three photoreceptors, so three genes to code for three different opsin. A red one, a green one, and a blue one, RGB, red, green, blue. And that is gonna shift the different color we can see, and it's a combined information of those three opsin that make us see those different colors. Uh, just to highlight how important it is, so trichromatic human, most of us, uh, have the three obscene and we can see all those color, blue, red, yellow, white, green. If you like an obscene, so commonly it's, uh, you like the red or the green one. Uh, it's gonna be much more difficult to see the difference between red and green, for example, and yellow. If you like the blue one, uh, usually you struggle to see the difference between yellow and green. So I'm saying lacking uh, just to save time, but there is very different, uh, uh, category or way of being what is called colorblind. When you miss an obscene, you can have a malfunction one, etc. But that is basically how we came out with this uh, colorblind test, where if you can see a five, then you have a normal color vision. If you see a two, you might be red or green uh, obscene deficiency. Uh, here, don't worry, there's nothing to, to see. It was just to catch your attention because I'm gonna talk about my results now. And here is for a gen phylogenetic tree of opsins in insects. So I took all the visual opsin gene I could find in all the insect I could. And uh, so it was well known that they clade regarding the colors they absorb. So we have a clade for all the opsins that absorb uh, blue wavelengths, ultraviolet wavelengths, and green. So both that red and and uh, green color are what is called the green opsin. What we didn't know is that when I did that tree, I found that all those opsin here that are highlighted in red, they also have a copy here that is in green, but the other way around is, is not true. And when I looked at studies that did a bit of transcriptomic and looked at where those opsin were expressed, uh, all the one with the star were expressed in the ocelli of an insect. So insects have the compound eyes that are their main eyes like us. But on top, on the, in between these two eyes, they have uh, between zero and three ocelli, uh, which are called simple eyes. And we don't know much about the role of those eyes. So we know they have a role in uh, how the way insects fly. They have a role in avoiding predator. But then now we found that we do have some opsins that are only expressed in those three eyes and are not in the compound eye, sorry. So that was um, a nice discovery because those, especially those uh, long wavelengths opsins are study a lot for phylogeny and species reconstruction. So, oh, sorry. 
what I did after that, I thought, okay, let me put that all in context uh, in the evolution of insects. So I did a phylogenetic tree of insect with all the insects I had and um, class them by order and family. So I just want to show you that here, families that are highlighted in red, they have three ocelli and the ones that are in white, they have uh, between zero and two ocelli. And I've put the number of opsin I found from each of these categories here. And I did that for all the insect. And what we can see is that we have a strong correlation between having three ocelli and having that obscene that fall in that uh, red color. So that added a lot to uh, that hypothesis that this obscene that fall in that clade are ocelli specific because they're only found in the ocelli. Uh, we also found that those uh, obscene that are in, highlighted in green here, present in every insect as uh, much as the one that absorb UV, which is important for phylogenic reconstruction because if you start to mix obscene both from the red and the green uh, clade, then you're gonna bias your phylogenetic reconstruction. Um, moving into uh, my next slide. So I did work on a species of insect called Sarex noctilio that is, has been introduced in Canada not long ago, uh, but was introduced in South Africa where I did my PhD uh, way before that. And we wanted to study the chemical and visual ecology of the wasp. So I took that same tree, but I just uh, did it for Hymenoptera. So I just took here are the Aminoptera. You can see they all have a copy of every opsin, basically. And I was lucky enough to have the genome of uh, that wood wasp, Sarek noctilio. And I dig into the genome, look for those genes, and put them in my phylogenetic tree. And I saw I found three genes, one corresponding to uh, that green opsin, one for the Ocelli specific one, and one for the UV, UV one, but none for uh, the blue opsin. So I thought, okay, maybe it's uh, the genome reconstruction was not that great, and uh, I have to dig a little bit more. You know, a lot of problems can happen with the assembly. So I looked at um, a different insect like bee, ant, and a closely related species to Sarex for that blue opsin and uh, it happened to be uh, always in the same spot in the genome with the same gene that surround it. So I was looking for those genes that surround that blue opsin in Sarex and looked in the middle and still couldn't find that um, blue opsin. And in addition to that, I managed to do some uh, physiological measurement where I basically put electrode in the eye of the insect and you flash different color. It's called an electroretinogram. And you can see uh, what color are being absorbed by the eyes of the insect. And I found that we have a nice spectrum for a green obscene and one nice one for an obscene absorbing in the UV, but nothing for uh, some photoreceptor that absorb in the blue. So, it's always very difficult to prove something is not here, but uh, here I've tried to pile up a lot of evidence to see that it is good chance that it's not here, or if it's here, it's expressed in very, very little uh, quantities. And that was the first Phymenoptera. Uh, so we found that Sarex noctio was the first one to miss the blue opsin and uh, the corresponding photoreceptor, which raised some question. Uh, why is that? Uh, so is it because the adult is not feeding? So the ecology of the insect is that the female lays their eggs in pine trees. Uh, that's why it's a pest, it's killing a lot of pine trees. And the larvae eat the wood inside and damage the tree. They stay there for a year or two. And then they come out of the tree and look for a mate. So is it because uh, the larvae doesn't see the light. Um, one of the common hypotheses in insect is to say that blue opsin is often linked to a nocturnal ancestor. Can it be that? But uh, what I'm more interested in is it uh, is it because it's only Sarex noctilio 
or is it other uh, species that are closely related in the synphata? Or is it because it's uh, forestry insects? So most of the work that has been done on insect have been done on pollinator. But when you look at uh, forest environment, it's very different. It's way less colorful. So it's a slight. So it wouldn't surprise me that the visual ecology of those insect are, is a bit different and the way they evolve um, their way through color perception and contrast, et cetera, is different. And very little has been done, uh, maybe just a handful of publication, even less. So I want to dig that a little bit more and uh, study a bit more color vision in insects. So I'm building that machine to study color insect at the moment in the lab where we can do that. Uh, and I'm hoping I can come next year with a few more exciting results on color vision in insect, in forest insect of Canada. And on that, I'd like to acknowledge um, the people that organized uh, uh, in the Species Center Forum today. Uh, my supervisor, Jeremy Allison, who helped me a lot uh, for that study. And uh, those two fellows uh, from Germany that uh, teach me how to do the electroretinogram in insect. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Quentin. That was really wonderful. I think color vision is so cool. It's really fascinating to think about what other species can see compared to us. Um, we don't have any questions coming in yet, but if there is anything, um, please pop it in the Q&A box. We'll also be putting Quentin's information um, in the chat so you can reach out to him directly if you think of anything later. Um, Quentin, is this data published? Where can people go to read more about your uh, research? Yeah, I uh, published uh, one article about all the uh, opsins, the, the phylogeny of the opsin in insect in general. And I also published my work on Cyrex noctilio. So what color, the fact that it's missing the blue opsin and photoreceptor, it's all open access. Beautiful, that's so good. Too. And there is, uh, if you're interested in more, there is some very good reviews that I can also send. Uh, Beautiful, thank you so it. much. That's so awesome to know. Okay, well, we'll move on for now, but um, if you have any questions, like we said, his email's in the chat. So thank you so much for joining us. That was a really great presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to introduce our second speaker, Owen Clarkin from Ottawa Field Naturalist Club. We'll be talking about elm zigzag sawfly. So thanks so much for joining us today, Owen. I'll pass it over to you. Thanks so much. I'll uh, start sharing screen in my face as well. One sec here. Hopefully that's reasonably visible. Yep, it looks great. Thank you. Okay, awesome. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for the uh, invite to um, come speak. I'm uh, thrilled to be here and can't wait to tell you about Elm Zigzag Softfly. Uh, so on the left here in two photos, on the left, you've got uh, a typical feeding trace of the Elm Zigzag Softfly. This insect only, as far as we know, uh, eats the leaves of elms and leaves a highly distinctive uh, trace, as you can see, a feeding track here. Uh, can you see my my cursor as well? Hopefully you can. Yep, we can see that. Perfect, thank you. And on the right photo here, you've got a, a fairly large larvae. Um, they're a little green sawfly larvae. It looks kind of casually like a caterpillar, but they're a sawfly, of course. Uh, their eye has a uh, vertical line, kind of a streak across it, and then the front legs have kind of like a T shape that's black to try to identify it if you're seeing it in the field, because sometimes it's actually eaten the whole leaf already. In fact, this yellow stripe here at the bottom is a fully consumed leaf on an elm. So sometimes you don't really see the nice zigzag because the leaf is already mostly gone. So what are elms? Well, uh, we have three native species, uh, rock elm on the left here, American elm, or sometimes called white elm in Canada in the middle and on the right, slippery elm. Uh, these are three uh, important tree species for Eastern North America. Uh, all the major textbooks, uh, especially in historical times before Dutch elm disease became a major issue, covered them as important species on par with you know, hickories, elm, uh, maples, 
uh, oaks, you know, just like very important. I find uh, in the 21st century and probably in the latter half of the 20th century, they started getting forgotten a little bit because I guess the uh, Dutch Elm disease had already decreased their economic value and that sort of thing. But ecologically very important uh, and economically very important when they're present in abundance. If you want to see more about elms, I actually gave a talk uh, in autumn 2023 to the Ontario Woodlot Association. This talk is available on YouTube if you want to learn more and you have an hour to spare. <laughs> Uh, so what is elm zigzag sawfly? Yeah, so it's an Asian insect that was first detected in Europe in 2003, around 20 years ago. Um, the larvae feed on elm leaves exclusively. They sometimes uh, cause uh, major trouble in Europe as an invasive species, causing you know, full tree defoliation and dieback. And in recent uh, year and a bit, it's been noticed to cause problems in North America, as we'll discuss a little bit uh, from the Ontario perspective here. Uh, the zigzag feeding tracks starting at the edge of the elm leaves uniquely point to elm zigzag sawfly presence. The tracks somewhat resemble a silhouette of fusilli pasta. So if you just want to think like, what am I looking for? That first photo I showed is a good textbook example. And just imagine you're seeing fusilli pasta, kind of a cutout of it or something out of cardboard paper. It looks sort of like that. Uh, very distinctive. Uh, so Elm Zigzag Sawfly was detected uh, southwest of Montreal in 2020, and there's a paper published in 2022 about this. This was actually noticed via citizen science and the platform iNaturalist, and then professional scientists uh, kind of figured out what the problem was and published this nice paper about it. Uh, a figure from that paper shows Montreal as being more or less an epicenter of what was known in 2020, mainly because I think the first record was uh, at St. Martin, a little bit south of Montreal, and then a few other records were noticed, I think, with some intentional searching. This record at Voyager Provincial Park in Ontario was by me and by accident. I just photographed some elms and uh, uh, one of the authors noticed uh, a, tra tra a feeding track of EZS in my photo. Uh, the Government of Canada website talks about Elm Zigzag Sawfly. I wanted to show actually just a mature insect. There's like an adult uh, insect there. So it's a sawfly black body with white legs. And the species name Leucopoda refers to the fact that it has white legs. I'm also going to note just uh, out of kind of uh, curiosity, it's kind of a funny, the website's a bit out of date now. It was uh, last updated in 2020, uh, September 10th. And actually the first record of me finding it at Voyager Park was taken a few days later for the photo. So need to update that, I think, a little bit. Uh, so indeed, in 2020, I was doing a survey at Voyager Provincial Park for red spruce of all things, but I photographed kind of just incidentals as I'm walking by. I think I remember seeing this weird pattern in this American elm leaf and just sort of posted the elm itself to iNaturalist as a record. And Spencer K. Moncton, one of the authors of that paper about the Montreal discovery of Elm Zigzag Sawfly, noticed my uh, iNaturalist record and contacted me saying he thought that that was an Elm Zigzag Sawfly feeding track, which led to uh, significant work in 20, starting in 2021 to see what's going on, uh, led by the Autofield Naturalist Club with me as the lead investigator. And indeed, we started looking uh, at Voyager Park and found it, but then also we went towards the St. Lawrence River for some other projects and thought, oh, maybe we should look for it there too, because who knows? The first elm I looked at at Voyager, uh, at uh, Cooper Marsh Conservation Area, which is near Cornwall, had uh, this feeding track with active larvae eating away. So it immediately became obvious that this is uh, in indeed pretty widespread in uh, eastern Ontario, 50 kilometers south of Voyager on the first elm that we looked at. Uh, so in July 2021, we started looking a little bit at the extreme eastern tip of eastern Ontario and just sort of found EZS everywhere. Just you look somewhere, you find it. And then uh, one of our uh, conservation committee members of the Field Naturalist Club, Henry Robertson, uh, noticed it also what we thought at the time, a so-called outlier at uh, Elmer, Quebec. And then, uh, but it turns out that that may not be an outlier from what we kept looking. Um, so just some examples. Here's, here's a typical feeding track uh, that we found during this uh, rush to document it in um, summer 2021. And then in August 2021, these are the August records on iNaturalist. Uh, we just sort of looked everywhere and kept finding it everywhere as we we're going west. Of course, we're based out of Ottawa, so you have to travel to get to eastern Ontario, and then kind of you can move west to see if you can find it uh, back towards home, so to speak. Very easy to find out here in summer 2021, a little bit harder as you go west. But we're kind of wondering already, like, is it west of the 416? Is it in the city of Ottawa? And um, we switched approach to just rapidly, uh, you know, to using car and binoculars from sides of roads because American elms and other elms are sometimes visible from the sides of roads. And you could ver very quickly fill in 
is it present or not present in this part of Ontario by, via roadside surveys. And indeed, in August 2021, we found it in the city of Ottawa, uh, feeding tracks, including the, the title photo there. Um, and because uh, my mom actually, who lives near the border between Russell Township and Ottawa, had found it at her property uh, the day before. So it's like, oh boy, this thing really further west than we kind of thought. And then in September 2021, we kept looking. It's getting harder to find, but you're just, we, we dedicated a lot of our volunteer time to looking for this. And you can see all the records here uh, found basically everywhere to an apparent western limit. So as you started to get towards the, you know, kind of uh, West Ottawa, Carleton Place, Smith's Falls, uh, you know, Brockville, get to get an Aquay, we, we actually looked in this area west of where these records are and couldn't find it. So it's like, okay, well, harder to find towards the limit and then impossible to find seemingly past that limit. Uh, just give an example of the kind of work. So here's a zoom photograph of an elm, uh, American elm leaf with zigzag, clear zigzag soft light tracks. If you zoom out a bit, here's that in that square, this is that same leaf. Uh, this is from a side of the road kind of park and look. And indeed, this is the non-zoomed appearance. This is just a, a kind of a flavor of the kind of work that was going on to find a yes, no presence essentially for a zigzag soft light. And this was in South Ottawa. Okay, in October 2021, before the leaves actually dropped, we kept looking really hard because we wanted to know where the western limit was uh, of this thing and found a few more records in October, but not really anything that much more significant. And yeah, just that's it. Okay, see you next year kind of thing, right? 2022. Uh, here's a summary of the 2020, 20, 2021 records. All the ones in Eastern Ontario were done by OFNC volunteers, um, and we basically filled in the entire Eastern Peninsula of the province. Uh, we noticed already in 2021 at, say, Cornwall, uh, this is causing a little bit of damage already. Some completely gone leaves and uh, a bit concerning. I remember thinking at the time, this is not looking great, uh, but we'll see what happens in the future. Um, and then, uh, so regarding the preferred host, we noticed that American Elm is apparently a preferred host. It seemed to have it, you know, everywhere you'd find the soft light, you'd find American Elms that have feeding tracks of it. Interestingly, our two other species, slippery elm, uh, we only found one record of EZS in 2021. And rock elm, we found zero records 2021, 2022, until mid-summer 2023, when unfortunately we did find it as well. So it seems to prefer American elm over slippery elm and rock elm, which may be kind of a good thing because slippery elm and rock elm may be pretty endangered unofficially. Uh, American elm is actually considered endangered as well, but it's very weedy, has a different kind of ecology. These two species, slippery and rock, are more specialist kind of, uh, of you know, limestone environments and more shade tolerant. Their, their biology is a bit different than American elm. Okay, anyways, here's 2022. Um, you can see we could, we found it a bit further uh, northwest, but uh, we also went to Vermont for a road trip, found it on the first elm we looked at. That was the first state record for Vermont. Uh, so that's here. Also in south uh, southern Quebec near Vermont. This entire strip here along Lake Ontario, except for this one record here, was one day. Just we took a day off work and looked along the north shore of Lake Ontario everywhere all the way to the gta <laughs> so uh oh and then uh, here's a zoomed in of the 2022 records here uh we didn't we we also found it in this region here but uh we were focusing on west and south uh because it seems very apparent that this is moving uh so uh from the southeast to the northwest Okay, then 2023, big trouble. So we were in Cornwall for uh, a baseball event of all things. My son plays baseball, and I just happened to go to uh, the local conservation area to have a look around. I'd been here before 2021, 2022, no big problem. 2023, full defoliation of American elms being the regular situation. Uh, this is an American elm that is looks otherwise healthy, but is just fully defoliated, uh, very similar to say spongy moth outbreak sort of thing, just no leaves at all. And it immediately is like, uh oh, and yeah, so the, the, this was actually a, a little publication we put on our OFNC website about it. And then also uh, Trees Canadensis, a web page run by Janet Mason and myself, we had a, an article about it as well. Uh, and then also when a, a kind of a dreadful thought occurred, if it's fully defoliating American elm already, uh, what's happening now is slippery elm and rock elm. So we'll see about that in a second. Here, here's a uh, full defoliation of American elm and some of these little, uh, 
there's like little like balls there like right there that's in here too those are actually the cocoons of the larvae so you know really not good um okay so indeed we went back to the cornwall area we took a day off work midweek and looked for uh slip realm and rock elm evidence of being used and indeed routinely found on slip realm without major damage and routinely found on rock elm without major damage but that was it had been completely rare before that so concerning shall we say we've seen similar patterns where maybe some invasive species switch host species in a genus after their preferred host dies back say with ash borer green ash versus white ash anyway 2023 uh, i was in toronto for a business trip found it there travier for a baseball tournament found it there and then focused on a northwest limit and also the highway 41 corridor where it was hard to find but was found at bon Echo park uh here's the records to the northwest in 2023 and other records that are currently on iNaturalist. I'm actually a bit behind on the ones over on the east side where we already know it's very easy to find. Here's maybe an important slide showing the progression from 2021, 2022 to 2023. I'm going to say this is about 40 kilometers per year from what we can tell. We actually each year searched pretty hard past the apparent limit. So for example, 2021 in this left pane, we went looking in Arm Prior, we went looking past Arm Prior, we went looking Carlton Place, Lanark, couldn't find it. Looked really hard to find this one at Dunrobin, really hard to find these ones at Mississippi Mills and Carlton Place. So, okay, and, and there's Arn Pryor as a point of reference, okay? 2022, easily found uh, kind of in the Arn Pryor uh, to fully south uh, kind of area here. So like, you know, past Carlton Place and then uh, southwest of Smith Falls, but also looked further northwest and couldn't find it past here. Because, you know, you rarely get a chance to track an insect invasion in real time. And we figured we might as well grab this opportunity as best we can and get positive records, but also areas where you're looking and you can't find it as negative records and try to build like a pattern of rate of spread, rate of damage, that sort of thing. So in 2023, once we saw the full defoliation at Cornwall, we looked really hard uh, west of the currently known limits. So for example, checked up this uh, peninsula up here by Westmeath, couldn't find it. Checked at the Pembroke area, couldn't find it. Checked the Highway 41 corridor, couldn't find it at all until actually like the last day where we had time to check, which was at Bonneco Park. We were sort of just running out of steam, can't find it anywhere out here, but actually did find it at Bonneco Park. One, one tree had been visited by, it looks like one insect, and one branch had zigzag traces on it. So it's hard to determine how much filled in this whole area is, but indeed one insect had made it all the way to, to uh, Bonaco Park as well. Okay, so the summary, uh, Elm Zigzag Softly is rapidly spreading across Ontario, apparently moving from southwest to northeast. And I'm going to say roughly it appears 40-ish kilometers per year as a conservative estimate. In Europe, there's some actually, there's some literature suggesting up to 90 kilometers uh, per year spread in the European invasion that started about 20 years ago. So it looks like it's pretty safe to say 40 plus kilometers uh, seems quite plausible. In 2023, severe damage, i.e. full defoliation of American elm was observed at Cornwall with near full defoliation in other eastern Ontario towns near the Quebec border, such as Alexandria and Hawkesbury being almost as bad. Uh, in areas where American elm was fully defoliated, Elm zigzag softly has now been observed to start using slippery and rock elms as hosts for their larvae. And now there's feeding tracks fairly easy to find in areas where, yeah, American elm was defoliated, but no major damage yet. But we don't really have any idea what that means for, say, 2025, 2026. So yeah, indeed, the eventual impact appears quite unclear, but the trend, at least to me, is quite concerning, right? You've got rapid spread and sudden onset of severe damage in an area where it appears to have gotten a couple of summers ago. So research by additional organizations is urgently recommended, especially for mitigation approaches. I, I, I want to say thanks to a bunch of people. I only have limited time. I'm going to thank the three people who helped out the most with this, uh, Jacob Mueller, Janet Mason, and my mother, Elsa Clark. And, and thank you for tuning in today. Thank you so much, Owen. That was a really informative talk. A lot of really interesting observations for sure. We have quite a few questions coming in, so we'll try our best to get through them all in the five minutes that we have here. Great. Um, first one, is there a temperature when they die off when overwintering? 
Uh, indeed, it seems like there probably is a temperature. I don't think it's fully known what that temperature is, uh, but it seems safe to say. I know we're having maybe an atypical winter this winter, but uh, as I recall from reading the original literature a few months back, I'm going to say in the minus 20s or you know at least, right? They can they can tolerate an Ottawa winter no problem. Uh, mm -hmm. In terms of northern Ontario, maybe you might be getting into uh, an average winter being cold enough to slow them down, but uh, I, I don't think it's uh, winters aren't going to stop this I don't think yeah Ottawa winters get pretty cold so they're hanging on pretty good then yeah um do you happen to know the percentages of the different elm types found in the province maybe which ones are more predominant on the landscape yeah so American elm is at least I'd say 95 percent of the wild elms it's a weedy species very common everybody knows American elm pretty well slippery and rock elm uh they're not as weedy they're more specialists of forest environment or like you know calcareous you know alvars or uh, clays and things like that so they're they're shade tolerant a lot of their populations the understory where say they're they're actually surviving by having leaves that uh, keep them alive in the understory say the sugar maple or beach uh kind of survival strategy where they survive under uh deciduous uh forest as for many years and wait for a canopy gap uh in terms of mature trees it's I'd say it's at least 95% American elm and then some percentage of that 5% remaining of slippery and rock being maybe two and a half each or something. They're pretty uncommon already, unfortunately. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Um, this person here is asking, um, why are you using iNaturalist rather than EdMaps to report the insect? Great presentation. I've never heard of EdMaps. Thanks for bringing it up. But I mean, I think iNaturalist is a default tool and anyone can, you know, uh, upload and also uh, see the data. Uh, you know, I've been working in conjunction with, um, you know, Canadian Forestry Services. Uh, the, the authors of that paper are aware of my work. I've actually sent samples to them so they can do DNA, DNA analyses as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I think iNaturalist is great, though, because, uh, yeah, anyone can do the work. This is unfunded work by volunteers. And to, to get this work off the ground, you know, how do you get the funding in the first place, right? You kind of have to do something, I think, to show that this is a problem. And then maybe I actually, I'd love to hand this off to professional organizations to work on the mitigation. Awesome. Yeah, iNaturals is definitely a great tool. Maybe you should check out EdMaps too. That's another really great one. It has all the distribution maps. Um, Yeah, it's a, it's a really nice tool too. We, we highly recommend that one. Great. I'll check it out. Um, This person here says they primarily work in the urban environment and have been very familiar and I've, I'm sorry, and I've seen very familiar feeding patterns on Siberian elm in Hamilton and Burlington. Um, does elm zigzag soft light feed on these species also? Yeah, so I've now observed it, I think, since rock elm was the last one where it wasn't using as a, as a host. Uh, Siberian elm and American elm seem to be about equally preferred. It, it, you can find feeding tracks on both easily in areas where the outbreak is bad. Also, it uses Japanese elm. This is Davidiana of our Japonica, which has planted a fair bit in recent years. So it seems like it uses elms ubiquitously, uh, but maybe in varying degrees. Uh, I was hoping rock elm would never be used, but indeed, now we've, we see it's on that as well. So, yeah, it's uh, it's it's on all the elms it looks like oh yeah so unfortunate yeah um this next person here says great info owen any observations regarding repeat feeding events so do they attack the same trees year after year or do they tend to move on and any guesses how many generations we have in ontario yeah, that's a great question. Um, so indeed, repeating repeat feeding seems to be the rule. So the larvae overwinter and like leaf litter and kind of on the ground. And I think they just, the, the, they're strong flyers is kind of the quotation you see in some literature. They will fly around too, but they also, um, they will just come back to the same tree year after year. And it's too, it's it, since we just saw severe damage late summer 2023, I think it's way too early to say kind of what what's going to happen next year there. But if you go back to the same trees, like I show in those photos, I'm sure they'll have a bunch of zigzag on them i don't know if they'll get fully defoliated or not but uh, i guess we'll see how that goes <laughs> right sounds good um just from your experience when do you think is the ideal time to survey for the insect in southern ontario uh, so that's a great question. So I, um, I was paying attention during spring leaf out this year and I noticed it in like uh, mid to late may already. So in areas where it's, um, uh, known infestation, it looks like you can find it easily before June. And of course, once a feeding track is present and the leaf, let's say the leaf doesn't get completely eaten, that feeding track is maybe there for the whole year, right? So you can start surveying in spring if you want. Okay, awesome. That's so great to know. All right, for the sake of time, I think we'll move on. There are a couple little comments here in the Q&A box. If you want to stick around and check those out, maybe respond, that would be really great. Um, sure. But thank you so much for your talk, Owen. That was really great and informative. Really appreciate your time. Thanks, everybody.
All right, so we're excited to have Allison Craig from Bioforest here as our last speaker of this session, who will be talking all about emerald ash borer. Thanks so much for joining us, Allison. Thank you, Maddie. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Let me know if it comes up. Yep, looks perfect. Great. And can you see the laser pointer as well? Yep, we can see that too. Awesome, okay. So good morning. Thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, like Maddie said, my name is Allison. I work for Bioforest. We are part of Lalamont Plant Care. And I'm happy to talk today about our old friend, Emerald Ash Borer, share some of our experiences working in the field with this pest. Uh, so the theme of the talk today is essentially where have we been with Emerald Ash Borer and where are we going? So in terms of where we have been and where things kind of sit today, many of you on the call are likely familiar with the fact that EAB has been present in Canada for at least 20 years now since it first arrived in southern Ontario. It's spread pretty much in all directions since that time and uh, it's likely that it will continue to do so in uh, new areas wherever ash trees are present. Municipalities and private landowners have really borne the weight of the responsibility for dealing with this pest. Um, and many have chosen to manage this problem with a combination of uh, a couple different tools, including insecticide treatments and tree removals. These management programs have been ongoing for a while and many municipalities in Southern Ontario have been treating for close to or even over a decade at this point. And many communities in this area uh, and soon others are reaching a point where their original EAB management plans that were developed maybe five or 10 years ago are now coming to an end. And there's decisions that have to be made about the future of these treatment programs. Um, we all know that municipal budgets are limited, the funding is tight, and there are many competing priorities for these dollars. So there's an interest in knowing if these treatment programs should continue, um, and not only that, but when they can start to wind down. So our research shows, uh, and this is essentially what I'm gonna try to demonstrate through the course of this presentation, that when you treat your ash trees early, so before those signs and symptoms are starting to show, you have a very good chance of keeping those trees alive and in good condition for 10 or more years. And with all the factors that can impact trees, uh, such as pests, diseases, extreme weather events, development, construction, et cetera, uh, tree removal and replanting is definitely not uncommon in the urban environment and often it's unavoidable and necessary. So because of that, it's important to conserve these healthy, mature trees wherever we can, not only ash, but other species as well, like oak and elm, um, wherever it makes sense to conserve them and maintain all the benefits they provide. So we've been working in Oakville for the past 12 years. Oakville is a municipality in Southern Ontario and it, they were one of the earlier adopters of ash tree insecticide treatments. And we've been working there in an effort to try to understand how ash condition is changing over time, how these trees are responding to treatments and how EAB is moving on the landscape. So with all the information that we've collected over these years, we are now wanting to try to use it to answer some of these questions that are popping up. So specifically, is it still worth treating? What investments have been made so far? What will those trees look like? How will they contrib contribute to the urban forest and continue to contribute to the urban forest? Um, and how does that compare to the cost of treatments? And the second question, when can treatments wind down? So obviously we don't wanna just keep treating indefinitely or stay on this type of treatment treadmill. So it's important to use an integrated pest management approach here. We wanna be adaptive and we wanna be responsible with our insecticide use. Um, and we would like to know when treatments are no longer warranted or justified. So to give you some context for the somewhat unique situation in Oakville, these are a few key points I just want you to keep in mind before we dive into the results of our, of our monitoring efforts. So in Oakville, back in 2011, Town Council set a very ambitious target to conserve 75% of its treatable ash canopy. Treatments started earlier than that in 2008, kind of experimentally. 
Um, and this was before we really knew what we know today. Uh, many of those initial treatments and the trees that were included in that treatment program back in the day were already exhibiting signs and symptoms. And they, some of them were even in further stages of decline. So keep that in mind. Um, as of 2023, last year, we have 2,430 ash trees remaining from the original number of 5,449. And right now, the replacement value, uh, replacement value is a common method that's used to value trees. So how much would it cost if you had to replace all of the ash trees in the same size and the same condition? The replacement value of Oakville's treated ash tree canopy is almost $8.7 million. And we used iTree to make that calculation. We also calculated the total cost for the past 16 years of treatments. Uh, that includes the labor and the cost of the product. And that cost came to $5 million. So just a couple of things to keep in mind as we move through this information here. So our monitoring activities. Since 2012, we've been visiting a random selection of treated and untreated trees along streets and in parks in Oakville. We've been evaluating their condition using a 15 point scale that we developed where one is a healthy tree and 15 is a dead tree. And we rate each tree on all the usual signs and symptoms. So canopy dieback, bark cracks, uh, woodpecker damage, things like this. And as you can see in this graph, the average condition rating of all treated trees remaining in the study, so treated trees are the green bars here, all the treated trees remaining in the study, the average condition rating is about four, and that's a good condition. All of the untreated trees, which are the gray bars, uh, they were either dead or removed by 2017 here. Both groups, the treated and untreated trees, they started out in 2012 around the same condition rating between three to four, but the untreated group obviously declined much quicker than the treated group. We also worked on developing these population delimitation maps uh, using data from a combination of branch sampling and green prism traps to outline essentially where EAB was present in higher populations or lower or even undetected populations across the town. And we progressed to this map every couple of years until the whole town was almost covered in this extreme population category. So we used this delimitation map from 2009 to kind of dig deeper into the ash condition data. And this graph shows the condition rating of only the treated trees. So you'll see that in areas where EAB was not detected um, or was at low levels of detection in 2009, that's the yellow and the light pink bars on the graph, those condition ratings started around two to three. So we would con consider those to be an excellent condition. And those conditions have fluctuated somewhat over the years, but they remain fairly steady around three to four. And we compare this to the trees located in the areas of moderate or high population, so the darker pink or the red bars on the graph. And those trees remaining in the study have an average condition rating of around six. And that's at the point when we would really start to see uh, signs and symptoms being noticeable. I just wanted to pull out a few trees from the study to give you kind of a visual representation of what these results are showing. So this particular tree was located in the low population zone. It was in excellent condition, had a condition rating of one around the time that treatments were started and its condition has remained stable over the past 10 years around a two or a three. This tree is located in the high zone from the 2009 map, um, just down the street from uh, Ground Zero in Oakville. It was one of the few trees in good condition uh, when treatments were started in the high zone, so it had a condition rating of three. Um, and unfortunately, its condition has slowly deteriorated over time. I'm not sure if you can see too clearly in the photos, but it's it's become thinner and there's significant epicormic shoots popping up. So. As of 2023, last year, it had a condition rating of eight. Typically that's the threshold for poor conditions. So unfortunately this one might not make it. This tree was also located in that high zone just down the street from the previous tree. It was in poor condition, as you can see in 2013. 
uh, it was a condition rating of nine uh, and the following year it was almost dead and removed from um, from the survey. So this is an example of what I was mentioning earlier that trees, knowing what we know now, this would not have been a suitable candidate for treatment, but back in 2011, it was included in this ambitious treatment program um, just because they were trying to save as many ash trees as possible. So in addition to monitoring ash condition, we've also been keeping our eyes on EAB population. So we started using these green prism traps that many of you are probably familiar with. We started using them back in 2011 when it was for early detection purposes, but we've kept using the traps at the same plots and the same density across the town. And we've noticed that they've reflected this kind of population peak and collapse, and now it continues to fluctuate year over year for the past almost 10 years now. So given the patterns that we've seen so far, we would expect to see fairly low counts in 2024, and these reduced numbers would suggest that the ash trees aren't under as much pressure as they were during these peak years and even in these post-peak years um, following the collapse. But the takeaway from, uh, I think, this data is that EAB is still present on the landscape. Unfortunately, one of the major drawbacks of these traps is that they don't tell us um, what density EAB is present at. We just know that it's still out there and we're kind of following these patterns, but we don't know the density. Um, and we don't know exactly the role of ash regeneration in natural areas or the role of biocontrol yet clearly um, and how those things might be influencing and will continue to influence EAB populations going forward. So with all of that information gathered, we're kind of coming back to the numbers and a very important disclaimer here, I'm not an economist, so this is a fairly simple analysis, but we're looking at the total costs. So all of the treatments administered over the past 16 years, including the labor and product, like I mentioned, um, comes to $5 million, plus the cost of removing and replacing the approximately 3,000 trees that have been removed from the treatment program over the past 16 years. And then we add to that, we're assuming two different mortality rates for newly planted urban trees. We took these uh, rates from the literature. We estimate, given all of these numbers, that this program has cost between 8.2 and $8.4 million over the past 16 years. But this is likely an overestimation for two important reasons. One, because many of these trees, many of the 3,000 trees that have been removed from the treatment program were removed for reasons other than EAB. So unfortunately, we don't have visibility into those uh, statistics or the reasons for removal. But many of these trees, I know just from being in the field, were removed due to storm damage, um, that ice storm that came through 10 years ago knocked a lot of them out, um, hazard trees, so construction activities, all of these things have contributed to removals over the years. And the second reason that this is likely an overestimated number, um, and I've mentioned this before, that in this particular community, many trees that shouldn't have been treated were treated. And that's just because it was so early on in the process, we didn't know now what we, we didn't know then what we know now. And even given that this, this cost of the program is likely an overestimation, it's still less than the total replacement value of the remaining trees, which, which we've calculated using iTree at $8.7 million. And that 8.7 doesn't account for all the other benefits that these trees provide, such as carbon sequestration, we're getting about $2,000 a year, avoided runoff, $5,000 a year, pollution mitigation, health benefits, real estate values, all these other intangible qualities that trees provide um, and that are really hard to quantify in an economic assessment. And then finally, as those treated trees are allowed to continue to mature and grow, their value will continue to increase over time. So the next question about when can we stop treatments? This unfortunately is still a work in progress. This trap data that we're gathering is showing gradual declines in the population. So like I said, we would expect to see some lower numbers in 2024. But again, we're using a tool here that was designed for early detection. We don't have anything specifically for population monitoring. And we still don't know what's the threshold at which EAB is no longer damaging. 
We also don't know the role of uh, ash regeneration in natural areas, like I said, and biocontrol, how those will influence population dynamics. So more work needs to be done there. And our technical team is working with experts in the field, entomologists and foresters to try to answer this question. So stay tuned for that. And then this is wrapping up. Um, for anyone out there where EAB is still an emerging issue and not quite old news yet, um, the data we've collected shows significant benefit. You can, you can get significant benefit from understanding EAB pressure and ash condition on the landscape and using that information to prioritize your treatments and removals to give you the best chance of success and minimize your overall costs. So when resources are limited, treatments should be prioritized in areas with low EAB pressure and good ash condition, and removal should be prioritized in areas with uh, high EAB pressure and poor ash condition, since those trees won't likely thrive in the long term. And then finally, treat early. We've learned this is very important, so before signs and symptoms are apparent, our research shows that if you do this, you're, you're giving those trees the best chance to stay alive and stay in good condition for at least 10 years, possibly more. We're gonna keep doing this work. Um, so we'll be able to track this over time. And as you're doing that, you're, you're maximizing the benefits that those trees are providing. So that's it. Happy to take questions if there's time. Otherwise, uh, yeah, feel free to contact me if you have any further questions. Thanks so much, Allison. It's so much good information. Really appreciate your time. We do have some questions coming in um, and they're related, a couple of them are related to biocontrol. So are there any biocontrol options for controlling EAB? Has that been done in the Oakville area? Yes, so biocontrol is underway. Um, that is a federal, um, initiative and I believe three different species of parasitic wasps have been um, released to date and this work has been ongoing for some time. The problem is that it does take uh, a few years, possibly even up to a decade for their populations to build up to meaningful levels where their parasitism can be uh, effective. Mm -hmm. So I think that's still underway and um, in their, they're monitoring the um, the parasitism rates and the retrieval rates and things like that. So that work is being done. Right, sounds good. Yes, and then look forward to then. Yes, absolutely. Um, this person here, does a single trees and treatment work for 10 years? No, so the uh, trees and treatments are um, bi biennial, so every two years. Okay, awesome, good to know. Um, is the decline in EAB detection through the through the prison trap survey possible due to a decreased amount of suitable hosts. So for example, most of the trees have either died or have been treated. I realize that does not explain the year to year variability though. That's what this person says. Yes, yeah, that is definitely a possibility. Um, there have been so many ash that have been removed from the landscape either just by dying or proactive removal. So um, that could be playing a role in the, in the declines that we've seen over the past couple of years. Good to know. And last question here, what chemicals were used for treatments? This, um, this particular community was using the product trees and trees and good to know. Um, there is another question that came in. I am going to completely butcher this name here. Is AB being found at all in other Osley species? Can you look at that chat? <laughs> oh, only ACA? <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, I believe that they've found it in um, Oh, it's, I think it's called the fringe tree. That's the common name. I don't know the scientific name, unfortunately. Um, the, but the fringe tree, I think they found it in that species in the more Southern regions of the United States. But to my knowledge, um, not in Canada, they haven't found it in, a, in a, any other species other than Fraxinus, which is ash. Okay, thank you. Um, does the chemical treatment impact other species? Curious if woodpeckers eat treated EAB if they're harmed. 
It does not. So there's um, lots of information and whoever asked that question, if they're curious, we've got um, lots of literature and scientific um, studies that have been done over the years looking at the effects of trees and on other organisms in the ash tree environment. So I'm happy to provide that literature if they wanna reach out to me directly. Awesome, thank you. We'll have this last question before we break here. Can the year to year fluctuation correlate to the biannual treatment schedule? It could, and that's something we're looking at. Um, the complicating factor is that not all these trees are on exactly the same schedule. So they are treating half of the trees one year and then half of the trees the other year. But over the years, those treatment schedules have been um, changed slightly, Fluc they've uh, shifted. So it's not, it's not a very easy uh, analysis to perform, but it is something that we're looking at to try and tease out of the data. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Allison. Great presentation, lots of great questions. We really appreciate you joining us. Thank you so much. All right, everybody, that's a wrap on part one of Forest Invasives. Thanks so much to all of our speakers for such an informative session. And I wanna say thanks to all of our attendees too for sharing all that helpful information about reporting flat pat uh, platforms in the chat. I can see a lot of really great discussions going on there. So we'll head to lunch now and we'll regroup at 1230 for a keynote presentation delivered by Dr. Richard Hallett from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So see you all then. Thank you. <laughs>